Welcome back. Last time, things were getting pretty interesting talking about pterygoid implants. Yeah. Now I'm ready to hear more about how to actually put these things in. You know, before we jump into all the surgical techniques, I think we got to talk about the uh, what makes people nervous. I know a lot of practitioners, they hesitate with pterygoid implants, the risks, you know. Yeah, it makes sense to be cautious, especially when you're working in such a, well, delicate area. Right. And there are inherent risks, of course, just yeah. like with any surgery. But I think we need to break those risks down, see if they're really as scary as they seem. Okay, I'm listening. What are we talking about here? Well, the usual suspects, right? Infection, implant failure, nerve damage. Those are risks with any implant procedure, not just pterygoid. Right. You can't eliminate all risks, but how do we minimize them? Starts with planning, like really meticulous planning, oh. thorough medical and dental history, of course, full clinical exam, and can't forget this, a really high quality CBCT scan. Yeah, the CBCT, that's essential for any implant placement, but even more so with pterygoid implants, right? Absolutely. You need that 3D view to assess the bone, you know, how much is there, the quality, determine the implant length, the angle, and see any anatomical variations that could throw a wrench in things. So it's not just knowing the how-to, it's knowing when it's even appropriate yeah. and having a really detailed roadmap before you even start. Exactly. And that brings us to, well, surgical expertise, that's absolutely paramount. The surgeon, they need a deep understanding of the anatomy of the pterygoid region and, of course, mastery of these specific techniques for placement in this area. Okay, let's talk techniques then. We mentioned the traditional drilling method and doc Dr. Diedrich's soft technique before. Can you break those down for us? Sure. The traditional way, you start with a full thickness crestal incision. Carefully elevate the flaps to expose the site. Then, using that CBCT scan as your guide, you drill a pilot hole. Widen it gradually to fit the implant. That drilling, it's got to be so careful with all those important structures right there. Oh, absolutely. Precision is key. You use different drills to shape the osteotomy, always checking the angle, the depth. You do not want to perforate the sinus wall or damage any nerves or blood vessels nearby. I imagine there's an art to it, even with the CBCT guiding you. There is. It takes experience, a steady hand. You're translating that 3D information into, you know, real world action. And the bone quality in this region, it can be all over the place. So surgeons often use slower drilling speeds and avoid tapping the implant. Minimize trauma, keep the heat down. So much more delicate than placing an implant in denser bone. You could say that. Now, Dr. Diedrich's soft technique, this is a totally different approach. Yeah, remind me how that one works. It's pretty amazing, really. Remember those single-piece pterygoid implants? The conical shape, the compressive threads? Yes, the ones that compress the bone as they go in instead of cutting through it. Exactly. Because of that unique design, Dr. Diedrich can actually insert these implants manually. No drilling at all. Wait, no drilling. How is that even possible? It's all in the implant design. That pointed apex, those compressive threads, the surgeon can actually guide the implant into the bone gently using hand pressure. There's a specific protocol for it. So the implant, it makes its own space as it goes. That's it. Bone is condensed around the implant, not removed. Minimally invasive, less trauma, promotes fantastic primary stability. That is incredibly innovative. But is it as effective as the traditional drilling method? You know, studies have shown that the soft technique, it can get similar success rates to the traditional approach. Plus, you get those added benefits, less invasive, faster healing. All right, I'm impressed. I can see why you're so into this technique. <laughs> but long term, how do they hold up? Do pterygoid implants really last? That's the big question, right? Luckily, we've got more and more research coming out, and it's looking pretty good. On them all years. Well, good news is... Pterygoid implants, they're showing really high success rates, like on par with traditional implants in other areas of the jaw. So you're not sacrificing long-term stability or function with this approach? Nope, not at all. Of course, there are always individual factors, right? The patient's overall health, how well they take care of their teeth, any underlying medical conditions, that kind of thing. Right. Those factors play a role with any implant. Exactly. But studies are showing that pterygoid implants, they usually have good bone-to-implant contact minimal bone loss over time, and the restorations, they stay stable. So those implants, they're really anchoring in and staying put? They are. And just as important, patient satisfaction. Studies consistently show that patients, they're really happy with pterygoid implants. Shorter treatment time, no bone grafting, and they get better chewing function. Aesthetics. That's a win-win. That's what's all about. Happy patients, successful results that last. But even with the best implants, the best techniques, things can still go sideways. 
What are some of the uh, challenges and complications that we need to keep in mind with pterygoid implants? That's a perfect lead into our next discussion. Let's dig into those potential challenges, those complications. We'll pick it up in the final part of our deep dive. Sounds good to me. We'll be back soon to explore all those potential pitfalls and the, uh, well, the pearls of wisdom for placing pterygoid implants. (laughs) 